dos. Listo. Ok. Well, welcome everybody for the uh, second plenary talk of this day. It is a pleasure, a real honor to have with us today to Professor Pauline van den Drisch from the University of Victoria in Canada. I uh, met Pauline many years ago. I was a student, I was a graduate student in California and she was visiting my advisor, Stavros Busenberg. And from that time to today, I've been following her and many, many people have been following her. Uh, uh, we have many students now in the audience. Well, this is Pauline. This is one of the most uh, cited uh, researchers in the area of mathematical epidemiology in particular. You probably know this very famous paper on the computation of the basic reproductive number. Here she is, so take advantage of her. And in a more formal uh, setting, I like to say that Pauline Van der is a mathematician, emeritus professor of the University of Victoria and fellow of the Society for Industrial and Applied Mathematics in 2013. She was the recipient of the Canadian Applied and Industrial Mathematical Society Research Prize in 2019 also given in recognition of her contributions to mathematical epidemiology and matrix analysis and the high impact of her work in many areas of applied mathematics. Her research program includes the study of stability in biomathematical models, matrix analysis, mathematical biology, especially models in epidemiology and ecology. Her broad applied and theoretical research interests range from the system mission models global stability of dynamical system, backward bifurcation and stability properties of signed pattern matrices, non-negative matrices, matrix algebra, combinatorial matrix analysis and network models. Pauline is a great mentor. She's a great person and you surely will enjoy very much her talk. She is one of the authorities in the area of mathematical epidemiology. Thank you, Pauline, for being with us, for accepting to talk in this very important meeting for us, the, the section, Mexican section of SIAM. And without much more to say, please, the audience is yours and the screen is yours also. Thank you, Pauline. Thank you, Jorge. That was a more than generous introduction. <laughs> and so good afternoon, everyone. I think most of you it's afternoon. And um, I'm very happy to be here, although I'm not really here because I'm still in Victoria, which is uh, southwest part of Canada on an island, but I'm very happy to be able to talk with you all here. And as Yoga said, please put your questions in uh, either virtually or ask them the way that he suggested. So first of all, I want to thank Max Iam for this invitation. It's a, a great honor for me to give such a talk. Thank NSERC for funding my research and particularly my students. Thank my University of Victoria colleagues for the support and then my wonderful collaborators and students. So you'll see their names coming up in the talk. So what do we mean by these threshold parameters? So I expect a lot of you know some of them in any case, so population dynamics they usually determine whether the population persists. And so we can use them to help for insight into control if we don't want the population or protection if we do want the population to persist. So examples that I think you will have seen is net reproductive value, sometimes called a rate, although it shouldn't be, <laughs> and the basic reproduction number, as Jorge mentioned. So, the aim of this talk then is to give a general framework for these threshold parameters, these and others, using what we call target reproduction numbers. And the key reference is a paper I did with Mark Lewis at the University of Alberta and Jixing Xue at the University of Central Florida. So let's see how I'm going to approach that. So as Jorge says, I like matrices. And so I'll talk about some algebraic theory for the target reproduction numbers. But I also like graph theory a little bit. So we'll see some graphical theories. And the two ideas, in a way, complement each other. So that'll be what target reproduction numbers are. And then I'll give applications here. So 
We want to protect the salmonoids. So these fish are not doing too well. What could we do to protect them? And then we have a weed. I'm not sure if you have this weed in Mexico. It's called scentless chamomile. It's quite pretty, but it's very invasive. So I wanted to get rid of it. What could we do? And then thirdly, I'll take a disease model to model cholera control. So that'll be the agenda that I hope to get through. So what is a target reproduction number? So this we introduced in originally in 2013 with Hans Hiestebeck. And I'll give us this now the algebraic definition. So you have a non-negative irreducible matrix. So this means each entry is greater than or equal to zero. And you target particular entries of this matrix. So the idea will be you want to target for control or to enhance the population. But let's just think of it for the moment as these SIJs are sum of the AIJs. So the SIJs are equal to the AIJs whenever the entry is targeted and zero otherwise. And then here's a definition of the target reproduction number. So this row is the spectral radius. So that means the largest eigenvalue and absolute value. And we want the spectral radius of a product of matrices S, which is the target matrix. And then this is the identity. And then this basically is what is left from A when you take out S. So think of this as negative bracket A minus S. And this, and then we take the inverse of that matrix. So we'll see why this is of interest as we go through some examples. It looks a bit uh, strange perhaps to do this, but uh, we have just to be a little bit careful. We have to make sure that the spectral radius of this A minus S, negative A minus S there, is less than one so that this inverse actually exists here. So let me give you a result why this might be interesting. So suppose we have a matrix A, non-negative matrix, and we know its spectral radius. And we want to target an entry, let's say AIJ. And our question is, how can we change that one entry so that the spectral radius of the whole matrix is equal to one. So we might have started off with a large number for the spectral radius of A. How do we just change one entry so that its spectral radius becomes one? Now, why one, you may ask, well, this is often a threshold between disease persistence and extinction. So this is what we're going to do. If, if this spectral radius is less than one, so the target reproduction number makes sense. Then the controlled matrix obtained from A, what you do, you replace the AIJ by AIJ divided by this target reproduction number. And then that will give you a spectral radius of one. So it's a, a very simple way of doing this as long as you can compute the target reproduction number. So I won't give too many proofs in this talk, but here's the idea of a proof here. So this is, a, of course, a very famous theory in matrix theory, perron frobenius theorem. So remember, this is the matrix, this product here, that comes into the target reproduction number. So the spectral radius of this matrix is Ts. And by the perron frobenius theorem, there is a non-negative eigenvector x so that this is true. So this is x transpose times the matrix is the eigenvalue times x transpose. And what you do, you just rearrange this equation and it becomes this equation here, just divide by Ts, which exists, we said. And then you see what's happening here is you take A, you subtract S, but you add back S divided by Ts. 
and then you get an eigenvalue one. So it's a simple way of changing your eigenvalue there. So I wanted to show you maybe a little bit more of an application here. So here's, to, I just repeated the definition here. And this is an interpretation of what this target reproduction number means. So I hope that most of you know about the next generation matrix of a disease model. So just suppose that A is this. So A is going to tell you if you have a certain amount of disease in one generation, what will happen in the next generation. And suppose that the basic reproduction number is R0. So let's do different targeting <clears throat> to show you what happens. So if you target all entries, so that means S is equal to A. So you see what you get here, you just get the spectral radius of A. And that's exactly what we mean or the way it's defined as the basic reproduction number. So the basic reproduction number is one of these target reproduction numbers. And we hear a lot about herd immunity these days, a particular disease, which you, you'll all know what I'm talking about. And um, our provincial health officer likes to call it community immunity. So I'm talking here about vaccinating. So if you could vaccinate more than one minus one over R zero of the population, then the disease would die out. So this is a, a useful number to find. Now suppose we do something very different. Instead of targeting all entries, we target one entry, just AIJ. Then this becomes very nice because we have rank one. And so we just get a number here, AIJ times this matrix inverse JI entry. Now, if we do a little bit in between and we target all entries in the ith row. So this was done in paper, is this how many years ago? 13, maybe more years ago here, 18 years ago by Histobeek and Roberts. And in our notation here, we call it TI star, that's the ith row. And what you do is you just add up all these entries here. And so the way they were thinking about it, or one way they were thinking about it was they had various cities and the disease was in all the cities. And then they were thinking, it can we vaccinate one city and eliminate the disease? And you could hear that you'd have to vaccinate more than one minus one divided by this number of the city R. And now suppose instead of the i row, we target the i column. Then what happens is, is we call this T star i, and you just switch the i and j. But it turns out that in a paper we did with John Moon, who's an expert in graph theory, that it doesn't matter if you target the i row or you target the i column, you get exactly the same. So let me talk a little bit now about a graphical method. So we have this algebraic method for the target reproduction number. And I'm gonna talk about the graphical method just for one entry, just for Tij. So again, A is a non-negative irreducible matrix. And now we put what we call a weighted diagram. So this digraph, it's associated with A, it's going to have N vertices, and you're going to put an arc from J to I if the entry AIJ is non-zero. And moreover, you're going to weight that arc with the number AIJ, the magnitude of AIJ. So, I'll show you later on an example of that. And then imagine this digraph, and this digraph is going to have cycles in. You might go from 
that x1 to 2, 2 to 3, and 3 back to 1. That would be a cycle of length 3. And we want to talk about what's called a cycle union. So you just take a lot of cycles as long as they don't intersect and take the union of them. And then we finally get what we want, WU. That's the product of weights of arcs of U. We take our cycle and we take the product of the weights of the arcs. And so this will be a number. And C of U is the number of cycles that went into our union here. And then we get this target reproduction number by targeting the IJ entry as a ratio of two sums. And this, this first thing is just going to put a sign depending on the number of cycles. And then this is just W on the IJ U here. So the UIJ are the sums over all cycle unions in DA that contain the arc JI. So the one we're trying to target. And then the Vs are the ones that do not contain that. So in, so did I say the Vs, sorry? <laughs> yes, the Vs. The Vs are the ones that do not contain, the Us are the ones that do contain the arc Ji. And in the denominator, we always put the empty cycle union as well. So, I hope it becomes clearer if I give you an example here. So here's the matrix A, I made a very simple matrix, two by two. So it has two vertices, one and two, and then its diagraph would just be a loop at one, a loop at two, and an arc from one to two, and an arc from two to one. So here are the weights of the cycle unions in the diagraph. So this is the empty one. There's the loop at A11, the loop at two. There's, this is a cycle union, notice. It's a loop at one times a loop at two, it's disjoint. And then we have the two cycle, A21, A12. So let's take A11 as the targeted entry here. So here's our formula algebraically. We take the matrix S, and then we take one minus everything else in A. So one minus this entry, one minus this entry, sorry, the identity minus this one. So just this negative and one minus here, and then take the inverse. So here is our formula for the target reproduction number T11. So let's look at it in terms of the weight of cycle unions. Notice the numerator, everything containing one one. So A11, that's this one. And then A12, A22, this one. And the difference in sign is because this has one cycle, this has two cycles. In the denominator, the empty one, and this doesn't contain one one, this doesn't contain one one, and the sign is the same because there's just one cycle in each case. So just going back to something that we looked at earlier, suppose this was our matrix here. So this matrix does not have spectral radius one. How could I change the one one entry, A11, so that the resulting matrix does? So what I do, I compute T11, and with these numbers, it turns out to be 25. So if I replace this entry by 0.5 over 25, I have the spectral radius is equal to one. So let me just show you one other example with this matrix here. Suppose I target both the entries in the first row. And that was what we called a target reproduction number. So that means any 
cycles with A11 and A12 will come into the numerator. This is what we have. Anything that doesn't have that will go in the denominator. You have to be careful with the signs, but let's not worry. So this is the type reproduction number. And look at these two, you notice the terms, oh, how many terms have we got here? Five terms, they're the same terms, but they're just shuffled around between numerator and denominator. And there's something else interesting too. If we equate this to one, this will be one as well. So this is a, a feature that you'll see again here. So I hope that uh, these ideas, uh, the target reproduction number, are a little bit clearer now for you. So let's start with a general application. So probably lots of you have worked with age-structured population models with discrete time. So I'm hoping that this is something familiar. Some of you may have done stage structured populations, which would be a little bit the same. So if xt is the population at time t, it's a vector, then population at time t plus one will be the projection matrix times xt. And the spectral radius of p, which is often denoted lambda, is the population growth rate. Why is that? Well, the population will grow if and only if this lambda is greater than one. So it really tells you about the growth. Now, when we have a discrete time model like this, we can divide P up into two bits because one of the bits will show you how it transitions between the ages or maybe the stages. And the other bit will tell you about the fecundity or the reproduction. So we divide P into these two bits, transition matrix and fecundity, and they're both non-negative. And then the next generation matrix is the product of F times the identity minus T inverse. And you have to, again, be careful that this inverse has to exist. So spectral radius of T is less than one. Biologically, that's uh, the case because you usually lose some of the population here. And then I expect many of you have seen the net reproductive value as the spectral radius of this next generation matrix. So this is in the math biology literature and also actually in the matrix theory literature. So what's interesting about this? Well, if rho of t is less than one, so this makes sense here, then this R zero, you think about it, it's exactly the target reproduction number for A, replaced by P corresponding to the target matrix F because this matrix is just P minus F. So here we have a target reproduction number giving you the net reproductive value. If we do something a little bit different, we take the target matrix to be P, then the target reproduction here will give you rho of P, which is our lambda, population growth rate here. So depending on what you make the target matrix, then you can derive either the target reproduction number or the population growth rate. So you see, I think, I hope how this generalizes some of the ideas. So let's go to applications to with some biology behind them. And I just 
show you a picture here of the Pacific salmon life cycle. And they start as eggs, and then they become fry, and then juveniles, and then adults. And I'm simplifying it a little bit because that's how I'm going to model it. And we go to the other side of the country and have Atlantic salmon. And again, they start with eggs and become fry, become juveniles and adults. So I'm going to concentrate on those four different life stages. So this is a life stage model. And we, in a paper by Hong and Lewis, they constructed what's called a Lefkovich matrix. So it's a little bit as generalization of a Leslie matrix. And these are the four life stages, egg, fry, juvenile, adult. And of course, because we're talking about a discrete system, you have to worry about the order of events. So here they produce B4 offspring per survivor. Then they have a survival probability, PI, and a proportion moving to the next class. So that's the order we're thinking of. And then what's the probability of staying in the class? Well, it's surviving and not moving. And so that's what these are doing. These are surviving as a juvenile and not becoming an adult. And then the T's are surviving and moving. So these are, what are these doing? These are surviving as juveniles and moving. So see, this is the structure of the matrix we find then. So what can we do with it? So here I just repeated the matrix. And I'm going to assume that the net reproductive value here is less than one. So these salmonoids are not doing very well. Question is, how could we help them? What can we do to protect them? Now, I'm assuming here that we can estimate the parameters. So I'm, I'm just sort of giving you the theory and hoping you've got data to put into it. So, Suppose we look at the first row and column, there's only one entry in each, and the target reproduction number, remember, is the same. So this will just be T14, and this will just be T21. And what we'll get out is R0. And here's our formula for R0. You can get it either from the algebraic method I showed you or the graphical. So if we just look at the numerator here, this is the four cycle here in the diagram. So in a way, the graphical method is nice. So what, how does this help you to protect the endangered salmonoids? So what would you do? You could increase the number of eggs per adult, which this term is, to greater than B4 over R0. Or you could, increase the proportion of eggs that hatch to the fry stage to T1 divided by R0. Remember R0 is less than one. So it gives you an idea how you could help or protect these endangered salmonoids if you know the parameters in the model here. So if we move to the second row and column, you can see what you'd have to do by computing Again, we just get our zero here, it would be the same target reproduction number. And then you would increase to T2, the proportion of fry that survived to juveniles by T2 over R0. Totally different way of helping the salmonoids would be to reduce the harvest. So that might be a very good idea. So increase S4, that's survival here, to S4 divided by T44, and here is T44 there. So it would tell you, knowing the parameters, it would tell you how much you would have to reduce the harvest so that these salmonoids still survived. 
So that was control. And now we want to do the opposite. So here's this sentence chamomile weed. And it's quite amazing. It, well, apparently, I got this from the web, one plant can produce up to a million seeds that remain viable for up to 15 years. So it's very hard to get rid of this. And Thomas de Kaminebeck and Mark Lewis had a model of this, which we now have taken to look at the target reproduction numbers. So we simplify this plant to having three stages. One is the seed bank, which we've seen can be in the ground for a very long time. Then the second is rosettes. These are leaves, basically the leaves and the stalks. And the third is the flowering plants, which you've seen these nice white flowering plants. So here's the projection matrix. And we take these three stages, seeds, rosettes, flowers. So how does it work? Well, in a year, the seeds remain in the seed bank with probability A11. So these are probabilities in this matrix. They germinate into a rosette with probability A21 and into a flower with probability A31. And of course they die with probability of one minus that sum. And then the rosettes transform into flowers with a probability A31. And the flowers contribute to all of the fecundities because they might go to a seed or rosette or another flower. So here's a digraph, yes. I wanted to show you a digraph here. So going back to that matrix, if there is an entry A31, which there was <laughs> positive, then we draw an arc from one to three. If there's an entry A33, we take a loop. And here we have, uh, I think a three cycle, yes, A21, A32, a13 is a three cycle. A32, A23 is a two cycle. So suppose we target the entries that correspond to control affecting the seed production. And we could do that by some nasty little things called seed weevils, which push their way into the seed and destroy it. So we could have some control here. So that would mean we take non-zero entries SI3. So all the ones in the third column. So that means the F matrix has rank one. And so we can compute the T, well, it's the third column target reproduction number. And it turns out to be exactly the net reproductive value there. So knowing the parameters, we would be able to design some kind of control strategies. But maybe another way we want to control it, we want to control the growth. So we could do that by, again, nasty little things called gall midges, which uh, worm their way into the leaf and make galls here. So we now would have to target matrix S, which has three entries and there'll be these three, two, one, three, one, three, two. So now the target re reproduction matrix here has ranked two and that's not so nice. So, we sort of take a direct, indirect way of looking at it. And we say, well, TS is the value of sigma. So we divide each of these targeted entries by sigma. And if we did that, then what we really want is to know sigma so that the spectral radius of this is one. And that will give us this quadratic. So it's, it's essentially the same, but just a, a slight variation on looking at the eigenvalues here. And it turns out that it makes more sense from the biological point of view to 
think of the quadratic in terms of one over sigma. And then, the, so this is the constant term. And here it is. So it's the weight of cycle unions in the digraph of this, which contain no target entries. None of these entries here. And then V is the coefficient of one over sigma, and it turns out to be this. And they contain one target entry. This one has a three one, three two, et cetera. And then the coefficient of the quadratic term, this one term, contains two target entries. So what happens here? We start with the flower, go to the seed bank, and then we go to the rosette, and then we go back to the flower. There. So we have this quadratic that we have to solve. But I want to show you even more complicated. Suppose we have a combination of the two strategies. So we can control the fecundity and the growth. What would be the best way to do that? Well, if you talk to an economist, they would say the minimum cost. So this is, we're trying to put a little bit of economics into the model. And this is, uh, something I've not done, so it's a very, not done before, a, a, a quite a simplistic way, but just to show you how this minimum cost effort would work. So now we take our controlled matrix and we're controlling these entries by sigma and these by tau. So before we did separate each one, now we're doing them together. And the tau and sigma are greater than one because we want to get rid of these weeds. So this, now we're going to use the same approach. We'll say the spectral radius is one when let's say tau is F sigma. We need a relation between tau and sigma. And here's our formula that we get by working this out. So we get tau is a quadratic in one over sigma. And now we have to assume something about the cost per unit effort. And we assume that D1 was the cost per unit effort for fecundity, and D2 was the cost per unit effort for growth. And then what do we have to do? We have to minimize D sigma star, because tau can be replaced by this quadratic in one over sigma. So a function D now depends on sigma. And we want to know the minimum cost so we want to differentiate d sigma and set it to zero. And what we get is a cubic or sigma star in terms of these d's and the matrix entries. So I'm going to just give you a very toy example. What we assumed was that each of these coefficients is one, and we assumed that the cost was the same for these two methods of control. And here's what we come up with. So here's the growth control and here's the fecundity control. And the control for the points sigma tau lying above this curve, that will work, that'll give us control. Below the curve will not work. And this is the point that would give actually the minimum cost. So this, um, if we look here at 1.61, this is the cost function for the minimum cost here. If we'd only had D as 1.3 D1, we'd be here and we wouldn't be able to control. If we have 1.9 D1, then we're above the curve and we could control it anywhere in this region here, but this would be the minimum cost. So I hope this method has applications for real biological systems. So here's now the last example I want to talk about. So it's cholera, which is a 
bacterium disease. And the point about it is that it can live in contaminated water. So I'm going to give a model, SIR model, with a second route, second route of infection. Usually it's not too bad cholera, but some cases can be life-threatening if it's not treated. And I was interested in this initially after the cholera outbreak in Haiti, after the earthquake there. And it seems to have gone along this river, the Artibonit River, one to two very quickly, and then spread out into these areas, which are coastal areas. So this is one of the things about cholera that it can live in salt water, so the bacterium can live in the water. Here's the SIR model that you've usually seen, the sort of standard one. The difference is now we have this pathogen, this is cholera. And so the incidence function is direct transmission between susceptible and an infectious person, but also indirect transmission between susceptible person and the pathogen. How does the pathogen get there? Well, infectious individuals shed it into the water with a rate C. Yeah. So from the flow chart, can get the equations. And this model was originally formulated by Tien and Ern. And I'll just look at the I equation. So here's the different thing about cholera, the two ways of transmission. And then infectious individuals can die naturally, die from cholera or recover. And then the pathogen is shared from the infectious individuals. So it's not, not really a a passing here, but a shedding, and then they're removed or decay with the rate delta. So is shedding a new infection or not? That's a, a question that we asked, and it matters because we want to write our Jacobian matrix at the disease-free equilibrium. So this is no infectious individuals, everyone is susceptible. And here is the Jacobian matrix. So that's just a linearization. We want to break that up now into a new infection matrix and a transition matrix. And we always do it F minus V. So is shedding a new infection? For this model, it is. And then the next generation matrix is FV inverse. And this is what we get. So we get a quadratic equation and R zero, the basic reproduction number is the spectral radius of this. So is shedding a new infection? Well, suppose it's not. And I'd be interested uh, to know what you think, but uh, Suppose we think shedding is a transition because it can only be shed from an infectious individual. So what's happened here is we've moved the C over from here to here. And in that case, now F is rank one. And here we get immediately, I call this R zero tilde because it's a different splitting. And you get a direct term and an indirect term. And why is this important? Well, it's the threshold here, R0 zero tilde is less than one, cholera will die out, greater than one persists. So notice if you're going to control it, you have to control both direct and indirect transmission. Because if one of them is greater than one, then obviously the sum will be. And something else is interesting that R zero equals one is exactly the same as R tilde zero equals one. So I could hardly uh, give a talk on some kind of disease without at least mentioning COVID-19. <laughs> now, if you take a very simple model and I emphasize that, and you put in asymptomatic and symptomatic transmission to control this virus, then 
in order to have effective control, both routes of infection must be controlled. Just like this, direct and indirect must be controlled. And that's uh, something that has become apparent as the virus has persisted. So back to cholera. And I just want to mention, but I won't go into detail, that we saw we had different decompositions and we got the threshold the same. So we got this in that example. Turns out that we can relate the two decompositions and either the spectral radius will be greater than one in both cases or less than one in both cases. So we showed this generally as we've seen in this example. So now I'm going to take shedding as a new infection. And look, how could we control cholera? What would we do? So assume we know the parameters. And so suppose we thought about isolation. So what would that do? We take individuals and we isolate them if they have cholera. So that reduces the effective human to human contact. So that's this beta. So it decreases beta. So that means we better look at T11. And here's our formula for T11. And we can work it out. And so if a fraction of at least one minus one over T11 can be isolated, then cholera can be eradicated. So it gives you an idea if you could estimate the parameters here how many individuals need to be isolated. Another way that is very good for controlling cholera is to provide clean water. Not always easy where cholera is persists, but what does it do? It reduces the water human transmission. So it reduces lambda here. So that would be T12. So you compute T12. And, and this will tell us how much we have to reduce the lambda or how much, if we can translate that into providing clean water. So here I just repeated this. And now what about vaccine? So there is a vaccine for cholera, but it's only about 60% effective the last time I, I looked about it. And it also doesn't last very long. So Let's not get it too involved in that, but let's just see what happens here. So what would it do if we vaccinated individuals? So it would reduce the direct and the indirect transmission. So in other words, it would decrease as zero, if you like. So that would be T1 star, a type reproduction number. And it turns out that's exactly R0 tilde. And then this will tell you how many individuals you have to successfully vaccinate. So if you know these parameters. And another way that uh, cholera can be eliminated is by good sanitation. So that reduces the shedding of this pathogen into the water decreases C, but remember that it doesn't matter if you work with T21 or T12, they're the same. So we can estimate how much we need. So the, the acronym for it, trying to eliminate cholera is WASH, W-A-S-H. So uh, what is that? Water, not sure about the A, I think that's just put in sanitation with the S and H for hygiene. So we've also used these target reproduction numbers in a network model. So this is where you try to have a, a more precise idea of the humans and the water network. And of course we need estimates of parameter values from data to plug into here. So how could we extend these ideas? Well, 
Oh, we're we could do two this. minutes. Yes. Two minutes. Two minutes. Good. Thank you. Should be fine. <laughs> I hope. So we could target just a part of an entry. So this could be a probability of staying. This could be a reproductive value. And so that that's possible using these target reproduction numbers. So let me just spend the last couple of minutes then on concluding remarks. What have we done? Well, I hope we've unified several of these threshold parameters and we've used them to give guidance for control or to help biological populations. We used it continuous with the cholera model, discrete time with the salmonoid and the weed. We put in multiple controls for the weed control and we tried to combine it with economic factors. So I, I know there were very simple models, but my aim here was to show you the methods and hope you could apply it to more realistic models. So maybe you have some data and I hope you could use these models. I'd be very interested to hear if you do. So, which was gracious, thank you. And if you have questions and comments, I'd really like to hear them and try to answer them. <laughs> thank you very much, Pauline, for the very interesting talk. And please, the audience, if you want to make a, make a question, please write in the question and answer chat that is in the bottom of your screen or raise your hand so we can give you the um, open microphone so you can address uh, directly Pauline. So are there any questions? <clears throat> well, while people's writing or deciding, Pauline, I have a question. Mm -hmm. Has this, uh, have this, uh, uh, this target reproduction number have, has been uh, extended to consider compartmental models with, with age structure? For example, in COVID-19, we have this comorbidity is very age specific. And uh, I wonder if there is a generalization for this kind of age structure models for epidemic diseases of the target reproduction number. Um, I'm sorry, Joga, I didn't quite get the question. Could you? <clears throat> yeah, just- Is it in the, the question? Part... And... Yeah, you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay. I can hear you, but I didn't get the question I could yeah the question is if there are generalizations of yes. uh, the uh, target reproduction number for compartmental models with with but with age structure oh with age, age structure I see right. yes okay so, so the one I gave you was stage structure but I think the age structure would just be the same in a sense it's probably a little bit easier isn't it so you'd still get a Lefkovich matrix so you th I guess the the person asking the question is thinking of discrete time models. No, I think it, I mean, it's my question. By I'm I'm asking the question. I, I'm thinking in continuous, okay. continuous time models. Oh, continuous time models. Yes. Right. Uh, I don't know of any with continuous time, but that's a very good point. So what you'd need there would be partial differential equations. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Now I understand the question. I'm sorry. I was. Yeah. A bit slow on the uptake there. <laughs> yes, I don't know the answer to that. I've not seen it, but that doesn't mean that's not being done. I'm trying to think of how that would work. I think there are some uh, generalizations of things like the basic reproduction number, but I'm not aware of type reproduction numbers, but that would be a very interesting generalization, yes. Thank you, Pauline. Oh, Any the... other questions? Are there more questions? Well, if there are no more questions, uh, let's see, let's check here. Well, I guess we thank you, Pauline for your very interesting talk. And uh, we, with this, this is the last talk of the day. And we see uh, everybody tomorrow at nine. Thank you very much to all for your attendance. I don't know, uh, uh, Gerardo, if there are any other announcements to make this time, or we just 
say it, uh, end it for the day. Um, no, 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 that's okay for the moment. Okay, then thank you, thank you all, and thank you, Pauline, and see you around uh, thank tomorrow you. And, and, and ahead in time. Next right. year, we should have something in presence, right? <laughs> okay, see you then. Nice. Thank you very much, Pauline. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you so much, Pauline. Thank you.